Okay. One, two, three. Wonderful. Thank, thank you uh, to everyone who's joining us. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. Um, you know, we're, we're gathered here to discuss this important topic on equality and citizenship uh, as it relates to uh, citizenship in Bahrain. Uh, my name is Anthony Hu. Um, I'm a researcher with Bahrain Center for Human Rights. And um, I'm going to be One, serving as a moderator two. today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to take some time to introduce uh, our panelists today. Um, first, uh, we have BCHR's very own Asma Darwish. Uh, Asma is our head of advocacy, and I know she's very excited to speak on this topic today. Um, then we'll have Devin Kennedy, Kenny, uh, who is a Gulf research, researcher with Amnesty International. Uh, I've heard a lot about the research that you do, so uh, thank you for joining us today. And next we have Drury Dyke. Uh, Drury is a member of the Islam for Democracy and Human Rights team. And I know from personal experience that you have a plethora of experience and expertise uh, in human rights analysis and advocacy. Um, and last but certainly not least, joining us is Shawan Jabin, um, the Secretary, Gen Secretary General of the International Federation for Human Rights and also the Director of Al Haq, a Palestinian human rights organization. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for uh, taking the time out of your busy days to join us, join us today and talk about this uh, important topic. I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's perspectives and insights about, about this. Um, and just, just for a little bit more context about our discussion today, uh, this event hosted by BCHR is particularly concerned with you know, discussing the state of equality and discrimination in Bahrain and to reflect on like the strengths and weaknesses of existing or, or perspective or future equal citizenship initiatives uh, that might come to light in Bahrain. Uh, in doing so, our, our goal is uh, two things. Uh, one, we want to raise awareness about these concepts, namely equality, discrimination, and uh, citizenship in the context of the human rights situation uh, here in Bahrain. Uh, and secondly, we want to generate ideas um, and spark new perspectives on urgent or necessary reforms to help resolve these issues uh, moving forward. Uh, so the roadmap for today is basically, uh, we'll start off with presentations of our speakers. Uh, we'll go in alphabetical order. Uh, and after all the speakers have concluded their presentations, uh, we'll jump into a quick Q&A session. Our audience members are encouraged to submit questions in the chat box whenever they'd like, um, and they'll be posed to the panelists during this time. Uh, then the speakers will have an opportunity to give closing statements and last remarks about uh, main takeaways from this event, things that we can work on uh, going forward uh, before we wrap up the event. Uh, now I'd like to turn the floor to our first speaker, Asma. Asma, please go ahead. Hello, Anthony. Thanks for moderating this uh, webinar. And hello to the co-panelists. We have Drawery, of course, Devin and Sharon. Uh, I just want to note something that if, if you could put your uh, phone or, or uh, laptop on mute, because I hear some... A vo voice on the background. Um, Anthony, what an important topic to talk about. And the, the title is quite appealing, Reimagining Citizenship. It gives us enthusiasm for change. Uh, being a woman, this topic touches me quite a lot. So uh, I have chosen to center my intervention around women and their reality under the context of, of equality. Uh, and I am hoping to leave other elements for the other call panelists to cover. Uh, to begin with, it is important to explain that nationality is the legal bond between a person and a, a state, and it brings full and equal membership of the political community. And Yet, in, in practice, in the practice of states, not everyone who is admitted as a national enjoys the full package of rights attached, nor the same security of status. The phenomenon of inequality among citizens is particularly apparent when examining the question of how protected the legal bond itself is. For example, citizenship by birth is more secure than citizenship 
uh, acquired otherwise, such as national, such as the naturalization. Uh, and mono citizens, for example, are less prone to withdrawal of nationality than those with dual or triple uh, or multiple uh, nationality. In liberal democracies, citizenship brings with it often a constitutionally guaranteed promise of equality of rights and duties within that community. Now, uh, nowhere within this understanding uh, of nationality is there anything to suggest that the nature of this legal bond varies among citizens of the same community, that some citizens are more equal than others. Uh, yet again, in the practice in the practice of some states, not everyone who's admitted as a national enjoys the same package of rights. Let's focus on women a bit. Uh, a feminist approach to this uh, topic uh, is even harder and uh, it's more challenging uh, for it being tied to social contract uh, theory uh, as, be, as women being inherit, inherently and inescapably uh, gender, gender biased. Um, and to give it more context, uh, Anthony, and more focus, uh, Bahrain, the small uh, Middle, Middle Eastern country of the coast of the Arab uh, Peninsula and due to its coastal location, has greater access to ocean travel and in consequence, a wider range of influence, influences than its Arab Islamic uh, neighbors. These influences have made Bahrain a more ethnically and religiously a diverse nation, and while still conservative, more liberal and accepting in its interpretation of Islam and traditions. However, women's rights in Bahrain have lacked in many ways. This openness has brought somehow positive change for women uh, and female rights in Bahrain, uh, where they are the most liberally educated in the Middle Eastern and North African region. However, Bahraini, uh, Bahraini law is a complicated combination of royal decrees, civil and penal codes, and Sharia law, uh, which is a religious Islamic law that comes from the Quran and the Hadith. As a result, while some part of Bahraini law uh, advances women, we might say that other part uh, of the law holds them back. Let us talk uh, CEDAW a bit here. The country joined uh, with reservation to CEDAW's articles that contradicted the Sharia, which included the prohibition of discrimination within governmental policies. Many laws exist that are discriminatory towards women. In Islamic court, for example, a woman's testimony is worth half of a man's. However, in civil court, testimonies are equal. Men also receive more inheritance than women in Islamic courts. In addition, no laws exist to protect women from gender-based violence. If a man assaults a female relative, he may face a few days in jail, but then only has to sign a pledge and pay a fee. Even more, a rapist may avoid punishment if he agrees to marry his victim. Also, spousal rape is legal. Let me take this a bit detailed. Article 353 of the Bahraini Penal Code exempts rapists from punishment if they marry their victims. It states, and I'm quoting here, no penalty shall be inflicted against a person who has committed one of the crimes set forth in the preceding articles, including rape, if a valid contract of marriage is made between him and the victim. If he was subject to a final court judgment before concluding the marriage, such judgment shall be suspended and its penal effects shall cease. Moreover, even though Article 18 of the Constitution of Bahrain says people are equal in human dignity and citizens are equal before the law and public rights and duties, there shall be no discrimination among them on the basis of sex, origin, language, religion, or creed. Nationality laws 
still prevent a woman from passing on citizenship to her husband or children on an equal basis as a man, which makes families insecure and can result in multiple hardship, severe hardship in terms of lack of access to education, employment, social benefits, health, and other human rights. The law says, a person shall be deemed a Bahraini national if he or she was born in Bahrain or abroad and the father at the time of the birth was a Bahraini national. Campaigns organized by local and international uh, partners want the phrase his father changed to either of child's parents. The state of women rights in Bahrain is complex and manifold. The nation's complicated combination of religious and secular uh, law stops many gender discrimination reform from reaching their full potential. Many NGOs and international organizations are actively helping to advocate for and win rights for women in Bahrain, but work does not this work does not exempt these women from the society norms pressuring them back into their assumed traditional roles. Also, the current political situation and human rights conditions uh, including an almost absence of uh, a political opposition on the ground in Bahrain, make it difficult to be optimistic about visible governmental reforms happening uh, anytime soon. To wrap it up, uh, Anthony, and sorry for having taken much time than planned, maybe, uh, I would like to say that citizenship is a right. It's not a privilege. It is uh, the common language for expressing aspiration uh, towards democratic and egalitarian ideals of uh, inclusion, participation, and civic membership. It is sad that there is still continue uh, to be a significant gap uh, between the formal governmental uh, commitments to equal uh, citizenship and uh, the reality of, uh, of women's life. Uh, I would like to conclude by saying that we are not a burden. We are active member of the society and we can only do this without fear as equal citizens united under one law, uh, looking each other's uh, in the face. Thank you very much, Asma. I think you said it really well when you said that citizenship is a right and not a privilege. Um, you know, having this feminist, bring this feminist uh, lens to the citizenship and human rights fight in Bahrain is so important. Um, and not, not just to Bahrain, but to any human rights movement. Uh, and you brought up some really good examples of how that applies in the penal code, how, uh, you know, there are distinct uh, and unfair, unjust uh, differences for men and women uh, who might be punished for the same crime, but different ways. Uh, and so that has been an important part of the citizens, equal citizenship initiatives um, uh, in, the, in the fight in the past and uh, moving forward. Uh, next, we have uh, Devin Kenny, uh, who will give his presentation. Hello, you can hear me, right? Good deal. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Anthony, and thanks for your remarks, Asma. I'm definitely going to be covering uh, some of the same ground um, you just did. And I do apologize because I am going to be reading my remarks, and this always looks uh, much more awkward in a video call than it does reading from a podium. Um, but I want to be precise in what I say on this subject, and I'm not one of those people who's gifted enough to be eloquent and precise off the cuff. So our heading subject is citizenship, and I want to start my remarks by first setting out the concept of citizenship itself. In its full meaning, citizenship means that the government exists based on, exists based on the consent of its citizens. The government exists to protect and enhance the rights of its citizens, and those citizens are all equal partners in shaping the decisions of the country. Bahrain's government is based on a different idea, that everything is a gift or a privilege granted by the king, or a makruma in Arabic. 
So there's a strong argument uh, that for Bahrain, what exists currently is not citizenship at all, uh, but only nationality. Nationality meaning you have a legal identity as being attached to a particular country, but not more. The concept of nationality does not speak to participation in political life or the proper relationship between the state and the individual like the concept of citizenship does. In Arabic terms, you would say that what you have in Bahrain is jinsiya, but not real muwatana. This is a problem of political culture, so it's one that goes beyond the capacity of changes in law by themselves to fix. A general revision of the relationship between the state and its uh, nationals, its citizens, would need to happen for the full concept of citizenship uh, to take root in Bahrain. That's on the broad conceptual level of citizenship. Um, a bit more specifically for the questions of equality and discrimination that are raised in the title of our discussion today, citizenship in Bahrain is discriminatory by law along two axes, gender and ethnicity or race. On race or ethnicity, according to the very first provision of Bahrain's 2002 constitution, Article 1A, I'm quoting here, Bahrain is Arab and Islamic, its people are a part of the Arab nation, and its territory is a part of the greater Arab nation. So it is not the nation or the country of those born there, or those whose immediately preceding generations, like parents or grandparents, were born there, or those who have never known any other country in their life, it is instead the country of a racial category, Arabs, and furthermore is limited to a certain religious category of Arabs. The ethno-racial definition of the nation is reflected in the nationality law as well, which at Article 6.1 sets out different conditions for the acquisition of nationality by Arabs and non-Arabs. For Arabs, the period of residency needed before becoming eligible for naturalization is 15 years, whereas for non-Arabs, it's a longer 25 years. It should be noted that Article 6.2 of this same law gives the king absolute discretion to grant anyone nationality, which again goes back to our initial point about um, the, the legal substance at, at, at a fundamental level on which Bahrain is based. Um, and we don't have reliable numbers on naturalization in Bahrain. So we don't really know what the pattern of naturalization has been. Um, but at least in writing in the word of the law, non-Bahraini Arabs are placed in a more privileged position than non-Bahraini non-Arabs when it comes to the ability to become citizens or more properly nationals of Bahrain. The second axis of discrimination in Bahrain's official definitions of citizenship uh, is gender or biological sex. Transmission of, and here I'm, I'm restating what Asma has said, so pardon the repetition, um, but yeah, as Asma said, transmission of Bahraini nationality to children is, um, is gender dependent, and this is addressed specifically under Article 4 of the nationality law and if anyone is seeking the references to this, the current version of Article 4 was most recently amended in 1989, I believe. So that's what you would want to look for, the 89 amendments. But as it currently reads, the general rule is, again, as Asma stated, Bahraini men do transmit their citizenship to their children uh, when married to a foreign woman, but Bahraini women do not. So if a Bahraini man marries a foreign woman, his children are Bahraini citizens automatically. If a Bahraini woman marries a foreign man, her children, their children are not automatically Bahraini citizens. So here again, the letter of the law itself is clearly discriminatory, discriminatory as it places one category of citizen over another, men over women, and their right to transmit their citizenship to new generations. So. I know that this only scratches the surface of citizenship issues in Bahrain. Um, there are also very politically charged questions around the rights of citizens based on their identity as Shia or Sunna, and also around naturalization of non-natives brought into the security forces. 
I present this picture of what the law says as a starting point for discussion of how citizenship is defined in Bahrain. And on that basis, it is clear that there is a long ways to go before even the law is compliant with human rights. Next. Thank you, Devin. I think uh, you made some really interesting points, especially when you were talking about how citizenship in Bahrain is uh, more of a gift uh, than anything. And, and what, what currently exists is more of nationality. Um, and you made some interesting uh, distinctions between um, how different people obtain citizenship and, and the inequality that, that goes into naturalization in Bahrain, uh, particularly between non-Arabs uh, and, and Arab people who are non-Bahaini of origin. Um, so those, those are definitely important uh, legal bases uh, to, to be included in, in uh, future equal, initi equal citizenship initiatives going forward. Uh, next, uh, we'll have a presentation from Drury. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, uh, Devin and, and Asma. Great, made great points. I mean, inevitably, I'm going to kind of touch on stuff that, that both of you have, have touched on, maybe in a slightly different way. Um, and I am going to kind of more or less speak off the cuff. I'm sorry, it's kind of with some general notes. And so therefore, it will lack the precision that, that Devin had. So the Bahrain Center... Uh, friends, they've asked us to reimagine citizenship and think about the rules and the place of discrimination and the quality in the question of, of, of citizenship and, and look at the challenges that uh, the challenges to equal citizenship in the in the country at local and national levels and think about um, think about messages and recommendation. And but from the get go, we're going to have to do this reimagining here online in this meeting with others who may or may not be watching because we're not going to be able to do it necessarily in Bahrain, I'm afraid. And that's the starting point of, of, of where I want to, what I want to explore. It's the context in which freedom of expression exists is such that it's not possible. We can't, we can't do this reimagining in Bahrain ourselves. It, it, the, the, the conditions under which um, parliamentarians are of the bicameral uh, parliament that, that exists in Bahrain are either chosen or so heavily vetted that uh, ultimately uh, extremely loyal people are chosen. It's not a place in which one would necessarily expect the, the re this reimagining or the discussion or the, the questions of discrimination, of race, of gender and so on to necessarily be raised unless it's sanctioned by, by the authorities in a structure and a conceptual framework that Devon has referred to. And it's, you know, when you think of, 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 of the, the, the kind of app, you know, the, what, what needs to come before this discussion, it doesn't exist. So the, the permission to get a newspaper license for journalists to work, for journalists to be, you know, to renew their licenses and so on, this reimagining process is going to be so subject to limitations and restrictions that I'm sorry, it's not even on the agenda, at least publicly, you know, in a way to even get it that far. Nor can I imagine, for that matter, uh, for, for those of you who, who are in Bahrain, who work in Bahrain, for this to be a matter of assembly. You can't do, you, I, I think it would be difficult for the Bahrain Center for Human Rights or any other um, genuine human rights body to kind of say, well, let's get together. Let's have a meeting to discuss issues of public and, and, and the uh, 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 state-led discrimination in law and practice and so on, because you need government permission to hold such uh, an assembly, a meeting. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's kind of not going to happen. I, in fact, I recall that the Human Rights Committee in its 2018 concluding observations flag that as an issue for the government to to tackle. So I'm afraid our reimagination is going to be amongst friends and through word of mouth. And that's that's kind of it. That's that's just that's that's disappointing. Then I want to touch on just really quickly a point very made far more eloquently by uh, by Devin, and that's nationality as a document, as a legal process, not citizenship. Not active citizenship. Asma touched on 
the 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 you know the restrictions that women faced in order that prevent them from the prevent women from being active citizens, including actual nationals. And I and I guess I just wanted to to look at that as well. And one of the things that we we've, we've not talked about, one of the things we have talked about, is women and and what happens, you know, how how women are in a sense secondary um, 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 citizens insofar as they are not able to confer. Uh, citizenship to their children or nationality to their children. One thing we've not discussed um, is deprivation of citizenship, the you know, or or deprivation of nationality. And and we all know, everyone on this call and everyone watching uh, will probably know people who have had their citizenship or nationality taken away from them. Um, the the government hasn't been backward about doing it. 31 in 2012, 21 the following uh, in 14, 208 in, 200, in 2015, up to 298 in 2017. Now, okay, they've restored about 550, but it remains the, it remains the case that an arbitrary process has been used to withdraw nationality, just the documentation, not the whole notion of citizenship, let alone active citizenship, uh, from those individuals, so that whole kind of, as as um, as Devin said, uh, that kind of counterpoint between Jansia and Muwatana is 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 relevant here. You know, they actually took away citizenship, and what does that mean for those kids, those children of those who have been subject to those limitations? It means that their citizenship, their nationality, uh, has again um, been removed. And again, the Human Rights Committee, I think, in two thousand eighteen, called upon Bahrain to amend the, the citizenship, citizenship law so that, um, um, you know, so that it could be, could be uh, in line with international standards, uh, in short. And the other thing is, again, um, some of us have touched on this in neighboring areas, and there Bidun, Bidun Jensia, those without nationality, there is a, there continues to be, okay, it's not big, but there is a, a stateless, an indigenous stateless community um, in the country, people who, again, as Devin was saying, you know, people whose parents are born in the country who only ever known um, uh, uh, Bahrain, who are who are denied um, nationality and with it notions of citizenship, and then that includes, and here's the racial element that that uh, Devin referred to in law, those who may not be of a, a of a of an Arab heritage, or they may be of, say, a Persian heritage. But are they any the less Bahraini? I, 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 I think it would be foolish to think that 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 they are. So I just want to just then. So those are the issues that kind of that are a priori come before, in a sense, uh, this whole question. And then I just was thinking about uh, you know where Bahrain is now, and I just want to cast my mind back to the. Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry. We're, we're coming up on the year, on the 10 year anniversary of the publication of the BICI report, the BICI report, 23rd of November uh, 2011. And I hope we come together to discuss that. You know, what has changed um, since 23 November 2011 to 23 November 2021. You know, that report doesn't address citizenship, it doesn't address nationality, it doesn't address these issues. But it, it also doesn't ignore uh, it doesn't ignore them either. Um, there are it does set out in 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 places uh, references to systematic discrimination in roles in public life, and this touches on 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 something that Asma was saying about you know notions of active citizenship, where where a a sectarian community has been deprived. Or not represented in in national life in the BDF in the national in the NSA National Security Agency in in police and, and of course above all perhaps in 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 government there is overlap it's not you know it's not a it's not a straightforward issue there are there are nuances and 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 I guess it 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 um, I guess what it calls into question here kind of dub, going back to the question where I began with is. It's maybe a bit unfair to expect of a of a non democratic context to impose upon them the notion that they are the arbiters, the the the, the kind of uh, 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 determining factor in how discrimination or equality 
um, should ultimately be determined and decided through diktat or decree, decree laws. We're talking about decree laws. Asma and I think and Devin also talked about decree laws. So I just, I, I guess, even those questions that even that that, that uh, Devin and, and Asma referred to about, you know, the challenges to equal citizenship, you know, citizenship, not nationality, just citizenship. Oh, sorry, nationality, not not citizenship are already difficult. We can't discuss them necessarily publicly, openly, in such a way that the government will engage. Um, it's already limited in terms of the documentation of who gets nationality. And so therefore, I would say, uh, in closing, really, in, in, in what uh, the, the Bahrain Center wanted us to address about the challenges, is that they're fundamental. Um, they go to the very roots. I mean, Devin talked about this in terms of the, 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 the legal framework but you know we're not going to think think about changing a legal framework if nobody can discuss it if nobody can openly talk about it and meet and and exchange ideas about it you know maybe there are merits to to some of the current legislation such as they are i wouldn't know what they are because they that that debate's not being able to be held without you know with people being able to offer the the counter view so i guess with just this observation, and I think it's kind of a, a, a one that everybody is knowing that knows about. Look, it's been in the news that the government, uh, the authorities, have engaged with the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights in regards to um, a new memorandum of understanding about, you know, human rights. So there is there is apparently some sort of wiggle room about adherence to international human rights standards, and and okay, it's going to be a a, a challenging. Um, a challenging discussion to to be had, but I guess you know maybe I'd put it back to to us and and and, and activists individuals in uh, in Bahrain to to push forward with this discussion actually to try to have this discussion in Bahrain. You know, if there is this wiggle room, if there is a kind of change in notion of of um, a kind of a political dispensation as to what can actually be discussed or not. Then, then you know nothing would be more fundamental as to say, you know, what is citizenship? What is um, who can be a citizen? Not just a national. Who can be a citizen and engage and take part? And I guess one thing I'd like to see uh, the government do in, in that discussion is restore citizenship to all those from whom they have arbi arbitrarily withdrawn citizenship. Um, and end statelessness in the country and those who are outside the country of, of Bahraini uh, origin as just on that level and just let people speak openly and have an open discussion and debate as to what are the challenges uh, that relate to these issues that, that, the, that the Bahrain Center wanted us to discuss, equality, discrimination, notions of national affiliation. Let's have that discussion openly um, be able to, for me to be able to visit Bahrain and think that I can have this discussion openly with my friends there, that would be great. And for us to have this meeting physically there, because, you know, it's safe to do so. Why can't we do so? Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. And I look forward to what you have to say, uh, Shawan. Thank you very much for those remarks, uh, Jory. And I, you made an interesting uh, point um, in that the, for there to be discussion or any sort of reform, legal reform, uh, regarding these equal citizenship initiatives or equality and discrimination in Bahrain, uh, there has to be other freedoms um, that are available to citizens and also international actors who may want to address <coughs> these issues. And so in order to have these initiatives and to have those reforms, we need freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. And without those, um, you, know, you can't really open up the the dialogue or, or the space in order to make these reforms that are necessary. Uh, I also really just want to briefly underscore um, another point you made that was really, really important uh, to address, and it's the deprivation of nationality. And it goes back to what Devin was saying about how uh, nationality or citizenship is more of a gift than anything, uh, because if you are um, arbitrarily revoking one's nationality uh, as a result of something that they've done, um, then that, that might not uh, for reasons of freedom of speech and expression, you know, then it's not really a right that they have. It's more of a privilege. Uh, and that goes back to what Asma was saying about how it should be a right, not a privilege. Um, and one last point that you made that was really important um, is the Vicky report. 
you know, it's been almost 10 years now, and there is a lot that has to be evaluated, that has to be addressed, uh, that may not have been addressed in the recommendations uh, that were implemented, and so on and so forth. Um, with that said, uh, I'd like to turn the floor now to Shawan. Thank you, uh, Anthony, and uh, it's a great honor to be with you and to join you in this uh, important event. Uh, I think uh, Devin and uh, Drury, they, you left nothing for me to speak about. And maybe this will push me, you know, for a few questions and things in history. Uh, I don't want to go to Karamita uh, <clears throat> long time ago in Bahrain, how they started and they tried to build their uh, equal uh, also uh, society at that time. Uh, the question here is, it's, uh, I don't want to go theoretically about the citizenship and even nationality, but let me uh, say what you can gain. Uh, I'm here asking, you know, and addressing more uh, states and officials, let me say, or executives, what you can gain if you discriminate against X and Y uh, from your nationals within your society. Uh, do you gain security? Do you want to gain, uh, uh, let me say, uh, stability? Do you want to gain uh, economically? Uh, is this a stable things that you can live with? Even practically, pragmatically speaking, if there is an oppression and there is an oppressive regime, uh, I think uh, things will be changed because the people, they will be eager, you know, to change this unequal uh, situation. Uh, because at the end, the philosophy of the state, uh, even before they reaching, which called the citizenship, it's like a, a modern and latest and the very important concept that we are speaking about, even for, so, philosophically, the existence of a state itself I think for a few reasons, you know, one is to, uh, if you're going to provide uh, protection to your citizens or let me say your nationals, uh, and if they feel that uh, they are living safely, they are not living uh, safely, uh, they will try to carry out uh, things by their own ways, you know, by their hands uh, to live uh, in uh, good life, uh, to look for their uh, protection by their own uh, uh, ways. Uh, this is the case. And I think this is just not just in Bahrain, elsewhere also. And the Bahrain is example because we are discussing these days uh, this issue. And here, uh, uh, to be honest with you, uh, I am optimistic that things will change for two reasons. In Bahrain and also in other places, but mainly in Bahrain. In Bahrain, because you have uh, a, an active uh, civil society and mainly, you know, uh, intellectuals and people like Asma, like Nabir, like others, you know, that's, it's a long list that we can name them, that they are fighting for all of these things. And they are fighting in a peaceful way. Uh, and also at the same time, they don't, you know, surrender and they don't give up. And they continue raising these things. Uh, this is, I think, uh, it will lead uh, to a change in one day. I'm sure that sometimes it takes a long time. We try to shorten the time of this painful and op oppression. Uh, but it's a clear. It's a clear for me and for all of you. And for from what you uh, mentioned, uh, Asma, David, and Drury, that... Uh, uh, you know, the situation there, it's not accepted by anyone who thinks uh, in a human way and also in civilized way. That's the issue because discriminatory uh, policies are there. It's clear to see that in laws, in practices, uh, mainly, you know, when you uh, discriminate uh, against people according to their uh, ethnicity, on the basis of their uh, ethnicity, uh, <coughs> on the basis of sex. This is, I think, 
a, a big problem. Uh, all of us, we know what's going on in, uh, in Bahrain. And uh, there is no political will uh, to change. Uh, maybe some, let me say, social a class, they are thinking that they, maybe they will lose some of their benefits. But I think the question here is, do they lose their benefits, for instance, or they will lose their benefits later on if they stay as what they are staying now? That's the issue, practically speaking. Politics in relation also to law, uh, legal, uh, economics, this is, I think, it's a very important even uh, discussion, and it's an important, I think, paper for also the future. When we uh, address the initiative, I think we have to address initiative not just from a theoretical, theoretical and the principled way, even a practical way. I think we have many things in our hands to address, to address to the authority. If they can continue build their authority and build their policies, on these bases and these elements. It's called the elements of, let me say, force. They are doing and treating people you know, by force. They are uh, treating the people, uh, you know, uh, inhumanly. Uh, these things, I think it's important also to show that it will not stay uh, for long. And this is against also, uh, let me say, it's a short vision. It's long, not long-term vision when it comes, you know, to deal with the society, uh, the stability issue, because sometimes they are raising, they say that uh, some Bahraini people, they are not, there's the, they have no loyalty to their country, for instance, and their loyalty is to uh, others. I don't see, you know, how it comes like this. You know, they are Bahraini first, they are uh, all the time uh, looking to develop and improve their uh, society, uh, to build, you know, a strong uh, society, but on the basis and which basis here? Equality, citizenship, uh, no discriminatory uh, actions, practices, policies, all of these things. This is right. Another thing is Bahrain, they joined uh, and they engaged in different uh, human rights uh, treaties and bodies. The question is, is that just for, uh, it's like uh, cosmetics? Uh, is it just to use it uh, in a media or in the meetings? Or is these things has to be enjoyed by the people and the practice by the authorities? These things, I think it's questions. I know what's happened in 2011, and after 2011, the people, they are paying a high price of these things. By using a stick, I think no one can build its authority in the elements of force, stick, uh, tear gas, uh, prisons. Uh, it's not. It's not a thing that you can build even your future. If you look pragmatically and practically to these things, it will not stay for long. That's the case. And I think everything is there. Even the elements of a change are there. The basis of a change are there. It means the people, the feeling, how they feel uh, as a people, you know, for their uh, future, for their uh, society, uh, what's their dream is. I see, you know, the dream that to have uh, an equal uh, citizenship approach in uh, Bahrain. The people, they are fighting, they are trying to make a change. And because of that, I said, uh, I'm not concerned, to be honest with you, for a long term. But I have a painful like this. Why they have to pay this high price until they reach that moment? That's the case. Why they have to be suffer? you know, that much until they reach that moment. But I have no doubt that they will get it, they will reach it. The question is how to shorten the time of painful and how to reduce the price of this. Thank you. Thank you, Shawan, for those insightful comments. Uh, you know, I think if there's one thing that we can all take away from this dialogue today, it's that same optimism. 
uh, the optimism that things will change, that um, these issues will be short term, uh, because it benefits both parties, both civilians and the government alike, uh, for people to be proud to be Bahraini. And that can't be achieved uh, if if there is still uh, you know, explicit use of discrimination in, in citizenship, if there is still constant inequality that exists for citizens, uh, whether men or women, uh, non-Arabs and Arabs, and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, the reforms that come out of this should, uh, can't be cosmetic. It can't be enforced um, by force alone. Um, and so without that, you know, uh, there is no clear path. And so we have to be optimistic that um, things will change, that uh, civil society will continue uh, to grow and will not surrender. Uh, and that we continue having these important dialogues about what uh, is the state of the issue and what can be done going forward. Um, so that concludes our presentations uh, for the discussion. Um, now we'll move on to a quick Q&A. Uh, if there are any audience members that would like to submit a question, please do so now uh, in the chat box. Um, either in the YouTube stream or, or on other platforms. Um, and as we're waiting for them to come in, uh, there's one thing that I wanted to ask Asma. Um, you know, Shawan mentioned uh, that when people are living in a oppressive regime, people, uh, civilians, uh, will be eager uh, to make some changes um, and implement, put things into their own hands. Uh, I know, I know uh, I remember that your Twitter handle is eager to be free, and I thought that was so relevant. Um, and I was wondering if you can talk a little about that and what your experience was. In fact, um, the name that came with my Twitter account, it happened in 2011 when I was 20 years old. So we could say that a 20-year-old uh, young woman really wanted to be uh, free to be um, able to express her opinion without fear of reprisal or oppression. Um, you know, the, the, the regime makes it hard to, for people to uh, express themselves. But then uh, I always like to also draw the attention to the, um, to the social part of, of uh, freedom of expression. Like, okay, there is the government that is uh, having a, a oppressive laws that criminalize um, um, expressing uh, opinion or ideas or criticize any uh, realities, but then there's also the social part of it, the society itself, the, the norms, the traditions, the ideologies, it's they both come together and they play a very um, uh, significant role in suppressing uh, a lot of voices, especially when when we talk about this subject uh, that 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 is about discrimination, equality between uh, between um, ethnicities, between uh, genders. Uh, the society as well plays uh, sometimes a positive role in pushing towards change which I, 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 I love it when it happens. And then there is also its role, negative role, in uh, pushing uh, the change uh, backward and um, making, taking the active, the act, the active actors in, in the uh, movement of change uh, to, their, to their assumed, as I said, assumed traditional law, uh, roles, like uh, you don't have to talk about it, uh, it has to be this way. It has been this way for so long. So we should not change it. Maybe for norms, may, maybe for traditions, maybe for religion, maybe for uh, civil kind of laws. But no, if it's oppressive, it has to change. If it is suppressive to one party, it has to change because um, justice will not uh, go go on for long. Uh, injustice, I mean, injustice will not go on for long, as Sharwan said. It, it it happens, but one day it will end. So so it has it has to change. Sharwan, Anthony, Anthony, I would like to share with you one main thing. <clears throat> This is what I have been sharing also with others, with other, with our authority here in Palestine, with Hamas, with others, with diplomats. I say that a globe is change, is changing these days. Change is everywhere. What's happened in technology and this revolution 
it affects everything. And the main thing affected was the feeling of the freedom and the personal freedom, the conscience, this value, this right, this fundamental right. And what it means when you are two years old, you start even before you start now touching the screen of the mobile. This is a revolution. And I think the regimes in Arab countries, in different countries, they still living in 1950s or even before. Time, society, people, they are changing. Everything changed around of them. And they are still dealing and treating and using the equipments, methods, ways, narratives, uh, techniques that different regimes they use in 40s and 50s. Today, I say freedom of expression and the feeling of it's a DNA. It's not just a value. It's a DNA. And they have to understand it and to study it. It's a DNA. Very that well was really said. well said. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I'd like to pose a question uh, to Devin and Drury also. Uh, you know, Drury, you mentioned um, the important issue about deprivation of nationality. And I remember uh, Devin and I were on a panel about uh, the arbitrary use of uh, deprivation of nationality to you know, oppress citizens, citizens in uh, Bahrain. And I'm wondering uh, to both of you, what can be done going forward uh, about this and how will this, uh, you know, increase uh, equality and reduce discrimination in Bahrain um, as it relates to citizenship? Devin, you're still on mute, so I might, I might just, just some completely off the cuff uh, observations. As much as, as, as kind of, um, you know, a face palm emoji as as anything else. Look, the from a from a from a government perspective, and uh, but at least with a view to some sort of incremental advance towards adhering to international human rights standards, the reversal of an arbitrary decision, again, arbitrary uh, in and of itself, would seem to be the very least that one could expect. And, and, and why, from a government perspective, might that be um, an, an attractive option? Well, they're still not permitted to stand for parliament. They're still not, you know, peop the, the, the laws that are in place now already restrict freedom of expression and uh, an assembly. Um, and so it would just be one less thing. Uh, I, I'm sorry, that sounds terrible, but you know, it would be one last thing for, for them to, to worry about. And, I mean, putting on a kind of humanitarian or a human dignity perspective on that, when I think of the few people that I know who've had their citizenship withdrawn in, in, in the UK and Lebanon and a few other countries, I just think about their kids as well. I think about their children and, and what that's like. They know that they're of this... Bahraini heritage that somehow has disowned them and that has kind of removed them and and that they're no longer part of that experience and 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 the arbitrariness that comes with that and I and I I find that um, as 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 much a kind of an insult to kind of human dignity as it is a kind of human rights violation. So uh, so there is something in it for the government to to however arbitrarily to reverse that uh, that decision. As a kind of, I don't know, selling point, active. I mean, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, morally or ethically from the get go. It wasn't right. It just simply wasn't right. Um, but it's the world that we live in, and so I guess all I'm trying to to put forward is that, look, 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 everybody, look, authorities. There is a way forward here. That, 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 that. Okay, does it does it eke away? Does it does it? Uh, erode your, you know, your political power base. Well, no, not really. It doesn't. Uh, but does it? Does it kind of advance the, the the notion of human rights or 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 the adherence to international human rights standards? It kind of probably does. So, I don't know. Just a thought. 
Thank you, Truri. And uh, your thoughts, Devin? Um, I mean, the question you posed was, what can we do about it? And this is always the most challenging question. Uh, human beings are better at making messes than fixing them. Um, I guess what I can say to this is that um, I have been interested for a while now and hopefully getting into a position where I can present some of the arguments that Shalon presented earlier um, to Bahraini authorities just as an appeal to their self-interest. I mean, um, as Shalon put very well, um, these aren't um, policies that establish security in the long run. And you find this in all national security states too. They impose very nasty repressive policies in the name of national security. So that's what they're trying to achieve, what they say they're trying to achieve, what they hope to achieve. But at least if you look anywhere beyond an immediate short term, this creates resentment. <laughs> resentment grows. Resentment's met with more repression. It grows larger. And ultimately, none of this is, is in favor of the stability of society. The societies that are most stable are the societies where life is nicest, basically. And life is not nice when you cannot speak and when <laughs> you feel discriminated against and so forth. Um, so yeah i if amnesty is always doing advocacy and most of our advocacy tends to be to international actors but i hope someday i have a, a space in a room with bahraini officials just to try and run that that line of argument by them and also secondarily the line that um that drury said uh which is that this is um what are they gaining by it even concretely? The number of people who are still denaturalized or stripped of uh, nationality in Bahrain is, is several hundreds. Um, many of them are in exile outside the country in Iran or Iraq or elsewhere. Virtually all of them who aren't in exile are in prison. So it's uh, there's no particular <laughs> gain to this. It's just a step of... Um, of demonstrating the power of the state to take away again on the notion that people don't have rights, they have privileges. Um, so why why look so petty? I mean, why take away? These people are already neutralized as far as the state is concerned, is concerned in terms of being in prison. It just makes them look unnecessarily cruel to impose this additional random punishment that may also extend to their children. That's okay. a great point, and you know, you know yeah. So, if you wouldn't mind, guys, just to to to, to, to jump in, just to chime in on this, and it's kind of not really related to the point just made, but but something that Shawan made uh, brilliantly, which is, it's twenty twenty one, and there are ways of doing things that are consistent with modernity and openness and a degree of transparency and inclusion that I'm afraid um, escapes a great many governmental structures, not just in the Middle East, or, but, but other parts of the world. And that, uh, you know, with a nod to, with a kind of reference to, to, um, to what Devon has just said, it is actually in their interest, it is in the authorities' interest to try to capture some of that, um, at least a bit, you know, at least a bit. And I, I, I kind of feel now in this sort of changing, however incrementally or in a small way, um, I kind of feel that, that I, or I'd like to imagine that we could come together, some of us in, in civil society and, and, uh, and, and, and bring this argument, bring these arguments, as Devin said, to the door of the authorities um, in Manama, in Manama, you know? Uh, I'd love to see that happen. Um, it's it's kind of not in our gift to do it, but um, you know we need we need some leadership from from uh, from the authorities. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. Thank you very much for for both of you, your comments. Um, you know, we're running out of time, and I would love to pose more questions to you. Um, but I want to give you guys the opportunity to make brief, uh, lasting remarks about. Uh, what should the audience take away from this conversation? What uh, should be the next focus um, 
in this kind of human rights movement. Uh, if you can briefly summarize in perhaps 30 seconds uh, or less, um, you know, something that should be done or some things that should be focused on or something that should be thought about going forward. We keep a hope. Let's keep a hope. We will not give up to fight for justice, equality, modernity, all of these things. And I'm sure that, that they have no doubt that a future for justice, no doubt. The question shortened the time to reach that. This is the case. And this is a message not just to the citizens. This is a message, I think, to the authorities. They have to learn from the past. Thank you. Just on, can I, sorry, sorry, Asma, just to jump in really quickly on the back of what, uh, what Shalon's just said. I echo all of that stuff um, for the 23rd of November, 2021, 10 years after the publication of the BICI report, the, the Bicky report. Let's, I'd, I'd like to put what Shalon has just said and uh, capture what, uh, what Asma and Devin have also contributed today and said, put that to the government to say 10 years on since this awful experience that you had, this, this, this hugely damaging event, now in this new context, in this a decade on, come on guys, let's, 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 change, let's change the narrative. Let's change how this thing's unfolding. That's my message. Thanks, Anthony. Mm. Um, my message uh, would be like, as everyone else said, keep on going. Uh, the society has to take the first move and then uh, the, the legal part will change. The government part will change. The society has to make the first move and it has to continue going. And uh, we as human rights defenders... We support every uh, movement for change, every movement to stop uh, injustice, uh, discrimination, inequality. Uh, in fact, at this very right moment uh, in Bahrain, there is a movement happening on social media, and social media is great. I love social media. It's it's about women who's been hanging uh, for years and years and years in divorce courts uh, in Bahrain, not being uh, allowed to take divorce. Uh, they, they, from their abusive um, partners and this social movement is great and uh, we support it and uh, we hope that ch change is going to happen sooner or later it's going to happen well I shouldn't have allowed myself to go last that's always a mistake um, how to wrap up I guess I would just say um, Assuming that some of our audience is Bahraini, probably at least some Bahraini opposition people are listening and watching, uh, I guess I just suggest that it is um, useful to try and think through some of the, the questions that I, especially me, but also others mentioned. Some of the stuff I said may seem like conceptual or airy or abstract or academic about thinking about what does citizenship actually mean. Um, but it's it's good to think these things through. Thought is actually dangerous to arbitrary power. That's why arbitrary powers uh, suppress speech because speech is the vehicle of thought and thought precedes action, or at least uh, thought precedes considered and wise action. So understanding what you're fighting for these principles is is worth doing and worth thinking through it's it's the first step not the last step but so yeah i just encourage people to keep taking that first step thank you everyone for sharing their comments i i love how inspirational and hopeful this conversation has taken uh, after highlighting some of the things that um we hope to some of the changes we hope to see in the future um, thank you, Asma, Devin, uh, Drury, Shawan, uh, for joining us today. Uh, and we hope the audience has, has learned. Um, I'm sure the audience has learned a lot from, from this insightful dialogue. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, and thank you, you Anthony. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.